Good evening. Welcome to Virtual Vespers. Um, it's a really cold day today, and we've had a seems like a cold snap lately, where we've had a lot of cold days. And uh, as it gets to be this time of year, when it gets much colder, and we're thinking about the holidays, we start to think about uh, the plight of the homeless, um, those who may have little shelter from the environment and uh, from the elements, uh, people who don't have a good place to live. Um, I stepped outside the other day and I sort of shivered and said, ooh, it's cold out here. And they all looked at me and said, think about how it might feel if you lived in a tent on a windswept airstrip. And it kind of carried my thoughts back to several years ago, about, I think it's been, I don't know, it's been four or five years ago. It's always longer than I think when Mel uh, decided at the height of the Syrian refugee crisis to go to Greece and to see if there was something that he could do uh, to be of help. Well, he went and he came back with some harrowing tales of what people had lived through to escape in the conditions that they were living in. And you know, even though that's been years ago, if you uh, look at those people now, many of those people are still living, maybe not as bad as they were then, but still in some pretty terrible conditions where they just, um, some of their most basic needs of life are not met. Living in, some, some of them are still in camps. Uh, there are some who are uh, living in just makeshift shelters or um, apartments in the poorest parts of the city where the you know, insulation's not good and they don't have uh, adequate water and food. Uh, just living in terrible conditions. And, um, and it's not just the Syrians, there are refugees all over the world, probably a total of 79 million throughout our world. And um, many of Syria has the highest number of refugees, but it's, I think it's followed pretty closely by Iraq and the South Sudan and Somalia. And even closer to home, we know that in the Latin American countries, people there are facing terrible persecution. Uh, their living conditions are terrible and dangerous for families. And so a lot of times those people head for the closest safe border which may be a long way away and may be the United States. And we look at how, how are we supposed to treat these people? Well, if you look in the Bible, there are a lot of verses that talk about how to treat the alien and the foreigner uh, in your land. But I just picked two, and I'm going to read uh, those from Leviticus 19, verses 33 and 34 says, When an alien lives uh, with you in your land, do not mistreat him. The alien living with you must be treated as your native born. Love him as yourself, for you were aliens in Egypt. And Deuteronomy 27, 19 says, Cursed is the man who withholds justice from the alien, the, fa the father, um, or the widow. And those are just two of many verses, and they're in the New Testament too. Um, and throughout the Bible, if you notice, Frequently, when you hear the alien, or whatever you want to call the alien, the foreigner, the refugee, whoever the stranger is that is living in your land, they're grouped with the orphan and the widow, which lets us know that um, there's someone that God expects us to help. And uh, the numbers and the need are so great all over our world. It would be impossible to help everyone. It seems, uh, sometimes things seem too big to do anything about, but if we can just help a few, uh, then I think that would be pleasing to God, that uh, you, we should help who we can. And these could include, you know, people who are displaced even within our, within our own nation, our, our homeless here. Uh, there's a story in the Bible about a refugee family, and I'm going to read that. It comes from, it's, uh, in Matthew chapter 2. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, incense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, 
they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed till the death of Herod. So here we have the family of Joseph, Mary, and Jesus having to flee and uh, take refuge, become refugees uh, in Egypt. And you know, when I read that, when I, we always read that story at Christmas, and used to when I read it, I would think about them going to Egypt and saying just a little while. But they were there for, it's estimated, probably at least two or three years where they had to stay until it was safe to go home. So um, we see that even our Lord had to live as a refugee. Uh, so I always like to think about it. If I help them, I'm helping Jesus. And he, all, and he says, if you've done it for the least of these, you've done it for me. And I feel like our church has always done a really great job of reaching out to and helping people. Um, I know... Uh, our church has helped several refugee families and um, given very generously and frequently during these last few years when mail was going back and forth to Greece and Turkey, you know, people would send money to, to help or, or have money sent even after he was gone to help with different needs that are going on. And I've had a couple of people ask me lately about some of the families that we've helped and uh, so I was just going to give you a little update on those. Uh, some of you may remember the Abdis, uh, Muhammad and Nalim. They left Greece. I mean, they left um, Syria. Uh, left. They left home in their car with their three children, and she was expecting another child pretty soon. And uh, they had to abandon the car after a short while. And they walked a long way and crossed over a part of the Mediterranean to get to Greece. They had a harrowing experience. And, you know, she delivered another baby girl there. So there were four of them with their, with their little girls that ended up in Greece. Well, after some time and a lot of help, they ended up uh, getting asylum in Germ Germany. Uh, the girls were out of school for several years, and so we're kind of getting behind. But now they've all learned, they've all, the whole family's learned German. I don't know about the littlest one, but um, the family's learned German, and they're flourishing there. And there was another young girl named Zalal Suleiman, who um, her family fled Syria. Her brothers and father went to Germany uh, because they were going to get jobs there and then bring the rest of the family. But then the crisis uh, escalated and the, and the mother and the daughters, they all had to flee. And uh, they ended up in Greece too. And um, somehow everybody got to Germany except Zalal. She was in her early 20s. And since she was what they call an adult, uh, she didn't look like an adult to me, she looked like a young girl, but she was um, left there uh, in Greece and uh, through some help and funds, uh, we were able to help her get to Germany. And uh, she's there uh, reunited with her family now. And there is another family that's been more recent uh, that probably everybody will remember, the Hassans. Uh, about a year and a half ago, our church raised $10,000 to help get this family of six brothers and sisters. Uh, they were in Turkey and uh, the conditions there, even though Turkey is supposed to be a nation that helps a refugee, and they were given a lot of money to do it, they weren't doing a lot for them. And they started seeking asylum in Canada. And so our church helped raise $10,000 uh, to get this family uh, to Canada. And the six of them are there now. They have, a, they have a house that an organization has given them to live in, and the six of them are living there now, and they're in varying stages of assimilation in school and uh, learning how to live there. So there, there are uh, a lot of success stories for, uh, for refugees who have received help from people all over the world. So as we uh, come into this time of the year when we really start thinking about helping those who are in need, who are homeless, who are doing without, uh, let's just remember to um, think about what God would have to do to help and uh, to give generously and to help our brothers and sisters who are in need. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for our home and family and friends and the many comforts that we have. 
We pray that you will um, help us to remember those who are less fortunate than we are, uh, and Lord, to remember that we are a brother's keeper, and, uh, and that whenever we've done it for the least of these, that we have done it for you. I pray that you will, that you will uh, send your Holy Spirit to touch us, and that our lives will be pleasing to you, and that we, we will be a reflection of you in this world. Amen.